Welcome to our next video for STAT 420. In this video, we're going to talk about uh, factor variables a little bit more, um, thinking about what happens when we allow for three or more levels for a factor variable and how we include that as a predictor in a model. And then we'll briefly also talk about uh, just kind of the case of creating larger models where we're allowing for more interactions. Um, so kind of giving um, a bit of a preview of what's gonna be coming up um, in future chapters here. Um, so, you might know by now that R stores variables uh, differently under different structures. And so, um, one common type um, for storing a variable is going to be as a factor. Um, some other common types would be character, as well as numeric. And so, depending on how we're going to be using a variable either in plotting or in creating a model, um, we might want to kind of pay attention to the structure of our variable when we're using it. Um, so, so character variables are going to be kind of the default whenever you have letters um, in a particular um, variable somewhere. So, so if some of the entries are letters, um, then R just kind of naturally assumes that's a character variable where there isn't an, an inherent hierarchy or structure of those variable uh, of those categories, but instead they're just kind of these separate, you know, equal categories. Um, if you want to think of it that way, whereas factoring means to kind of have some assignment of, of hierarchy. It means that there's this underlying assignment of zeros, ones, twos, and threes to these different categories. Um, and so a lot of times when we're building a model and we're we're creating we're assigning a variable to be a dummy variable we'll need to um, change that variable to be a factor variable. Um, so, so one way that you can do that is with a command called as.factor. And then inside, you would just name your variable. So, so data, dollar sign, variable, assuming it's a variable within some data, which is what we're most likely doing. Um, and then you would just kind of rewrite that over the original variable like this. Oops, kind of ran out of room there. Um, so, so data variable equals as dot factor data variable. This would simply turn that variable into a factor variable in case you want to use it for modeling purposes, um, where we want to use the different categories as levels that have an assignment of zero or one or something like that. Um, we can also affect um, the the ordering of categories. So R will usually default to so an in an alphabetic sorting there where the alphabetically first category gets assigned to zero, the alphabetically second category gets assigned to one, et cetera. Um, but we can manipulate that. Um, one way to do that is just to literally change the, the values or the, the entries in the cells to zeros and ones. Um, so, so here's an example of a command that does that. Um, this would assign uh, male and female, or well, it would assign females to one and it would assign males to zero. Um, however, that's usually not the ideal option because it's probably helpful to go ahead and hold on to those original names. So instead, what you might want to do is just kind of do a behind the scenes factoring or ordering where I can use this factor function here. Um, and then I can just um, basically assign levels and the ordering in which I put those levels determines what level gets assigned to what value. So since I put male first, that means that male would be assigned to zero and female would be assigned to one if I did this in this case. Um, so that would be, I guess, opposite of this alphabetic order that I believe R would do in this case. So just as an example, um, over here on the left is what happens if I don't do any custom ordering. I just throw in gender as a um, predictor here. It assigns male to one. It assigns female to zero. So, so whichever one shows up is whatever one is assigned to one. Over here is what happens if I run this um, whole function right here. I'm going to see now female show up as assigned to one, and I'm going to have a coefficient for when female is true for a particular observation. Now, um, you might be wondering by now what happens when we have three or more levels um, because we've only talked about assigning zeros and ones. So you might be wondering, do we assign zeros, ones, and twos if we have three levels um, or something else? 
Um, and so we're going to get into that by looking at this example with iris plants, where we're going to try to model sepal length from sepal width and species. So you might notice that if we color code by species, we have different clusters here where this appears to be one species, this area appears to be one species, and then this area appears to be one species, obviously with a little bit of overlap. Um, but if we keep track of species as a predictor, we're going to make a much better prediction than if we don't. Um, because if I'm just looking at the scatter plot and uh, ignoring the color and just trying to fit these dots, trying to use sepal width as a predictor for sepal length, I'm not going to be able to, to make a very accurate um, best fit line. But if I basically make different best fit lines for each um, species, I'm going to have a much more accurate model here. Um, so we're going to assume, in this case, an additive model, meaning that the slopes are all going to be the same. In other words, that the species, um, the species relationship with sepal length does not depend on sepal width. In other words, this kind of change between species in predicting sepal length appears to be constant and appears to be that same additive difference, um, regardless of what's going on with sepal width. So um, what we're going to do here is if we have three um, factor, or sorry, three levels, we're going to create three dummy variables, v1, v2, and v3, where v1 takes the value 1 when one species is the case, v2 takes the value 1 when another species is the case, v3 takes 1 when another species is the case. And so we can use that as kind of this present or absent indicator in our model. And so you might be thinking, um, that, that if we have v1, v2, and v3, then you're going to see v1, v2, and v3 as variables in this model. But you might notice here that we actually only have v2 and v3 showing up, but not v1. And the reason for that is because uh, it would be redundant information if I already have an intercept term, because v1 plus v2 plus v3 is going to add up to 1. Um, only one of them is going to be true. And if I already know that these two values are zero, then um, that means that the first species must be true. And therefore, the intercept term is now going to kind of stand in as the intercept in the case of v1 equaling 1, whereas this is going to be our correction for um, the intercept if this is true. This would be our correction for the intercept if this one is true. Um, so uh, another way to think about it here is we can kind of fit three different lines, one for each species, and this is how it would be, it would kind of shake out here, where again, we're just really adjusting the intercept. If there's no interaction, if this is an additive model that doesn't depend on sepal width, there's no interaction between sepal width and species here, then all we're doing is changing the intercept depending on which species is true. We have some base level here, some base um, um, kind of category, and then we just adjust the intercept depending on whether one of the other dummy variables is true um, by the coefficient on that particular dummy variable. Um, and then behind my head here is just something I'd already written before, but it's, um, in case you're wondering, it's just that 1 equals v1 plus v2 plus v3. All right. Um, I guess oh, I will mention one thing. Um, we could optionally um, write this model in such a way that we actually have v1, v2, and v3 show up as variables. But if we did that, we would just take out the slope in that case because now the, I'm sorry, not the slope, the intercept in that case because the intercept would now be redundant information. There would be no reason that we need all four of those terms. So it's really just kind of a choice of either the intercept stands in for v1 or we explicitly put v1 and adjust the coefficients and then just not have an intercept. Um, it would be, there's some mathematical reasons why we don't write the model to include all four, even though we theoretically could write a formula that does that. Um, but there's some mathematical issues with that, such that we're going to choose one of these two options. We'll, we'll typically be doing this particular um, um, parametrization. All right, so what if we want to model interactions, though, if we have three or more levels here? Um, so here's a case where if we're trying to predict sepal, I'm sorry, if we're trying to predict petal length from sepal length, 
um, you'll notice here that this doesn't seem to be quite additive with species. In other words, the line that I would fit for this particular species is going to have a different slope than the one I would fit for this one and this one. Um, so for that reason, it looks like there is an interaction between species and sepal length that I want to capture. The, the value of sepal length is going to determine how much effect I should see because this is not going to be um, exactly um, additive anymore. In other words, the, the amount that I'm going to change or adjust um, between species now depends on what the sepal length happens to be. Now over here is an example of our additive model. So you'll see that we have a coefficient for the slope, we have a coefficient for category two a cate and category three. These would be the adjustments I make to the intercept if one of those is true. The intercept stands alone if the first category is true. Um, but if I want to do an interaction, um, I'm going to do something like this. Um, so by the way, in case you're wondering how to write this, I think you can see it in the book. Um, this is going to be LM of, uh, let's see, pedal length tilde sepal length and then an asterisk times species. So the difference here is I'm not going to add species, I'm going to multiply by species and that's code in R for including the interactions. Um, so when I do that, uh, I'm going to get this output here. You're going to notice again that I have the same, I have two out of three um, of my categories showing up as intercept adjustments, and then I have the same two out of three categories showing up as slope adjustments here. And so um, you'll notice that our, that our equation up here, um, there's going to be some similarity up until this point, but now I've also added two interaction terms based on V2 and V3. Now I do want to kind of make some room here uh, because what's going on is um, if, uh, let's see, I guess it would be cetoses are true. My equation is going to be y equals beta naught plus beta 1x plus epsilon. And that's it. It's just the base equation is represented by the factor level associated with zero. But if I'm looking at versicolors, I'm going to have y equals beta naught plus um, this uh, beta 2 term. And that's because um, v2 would be 1 in this case. v2 would be the dummy variable that's true. So I'm going to add beta 2 now as an, in, as an intercept adjustment when, um, when v2 equals 1. This is going to adjust this one. I'm also going to have a slope adjustment based on this uh, particular species being the case. So I'm going to do beta 1 plus gamma 2. Um, so this is, I'm just going to write a y. Um, so gamma 2 times x. And I'll kind of break up again why this happened, and then plus an epsilon over here. That's because um, if v2 is 1, then I'm going to add this gamma 2 times x as an adjustment to beta 1x. And if you remember algebra, I can add like terms. So beta 1x plus gamma 2x is going to be beta 1 plus gamma 2 times x. Um, so this would be the equation for versicolors. And then as you can probably guess, um, for virginicas, it's going to be y equals beta naught plus beta 3 plus beta 1 plus gamma 3 times x plus epsilon. So again, with an, inter with an interaction, I'm basically adjusting the slope depending on which species is true. Um, with, and then the, the standard um, additive terms are just going to be adjusting the um, intercept values. So um, I think on this page, what we're going to do is just uh, write out the full equation with the values included. I did also want to throw in the F test here. So just as kind of a, a quick word here, um, this, this um, output here helps us determine if anything was added by including these interactions. So I ran a model to compare the interaction model right here with the additive model. And the F test result shows a pretty low p-value, meaning that we're, we're highly confident that we are gaining some 
predictive power by including these interaction terms. Um, we could look at the t-test results, but the t-test results can be confusing, especially if I'm going more than one predictor at a time. If I'm only adding one predictor, it should be the same p-value. If I'm adding two terms together, then I can't simply look at the p-values because um, they're going to be different. Maybe one looks significant, one is more borderline. The f-test can make a, kind of a, a, a total conclusion of whether something is being added by adding both terms. However, we are going to begin to talk about model selection in coming chapters as well. We're not going to, we don't always do an f-test to compare every possible model um, by hand like this. Instead, there are some algorithms that we can use um, to kind of choose best predictors, especially when we have a lot of different combinations. So, so what we're going to do here is just write out the equation with the appropriate coefficients here. So it's going to be, um, um, let's see, was it, what was our, I can't even remember, petal length. I'm going to put a hat on it to represent this is our estimate for petal length is going to be this intercept value, uh, 0 0.8031 plus 0 0.1316 times sepal length. And then our first um, um, factor um, addition is going to be this versicolor species. I'm just going to use uh, V2 at this point because it's going to get really wordy to write out. Um, so that's going to be actually a negative number minus 0.6179 times V2. And then we have a minus 0.1926 times V3. And then I'm going to put the interactions down here because I'm already running around out of room. 0.5548 times V2 X1, or I guess it would just be X. Well, I guess I, I wrote sepal link there. So maybe, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be consistent. I'm just going to write this as X because that will get confusing if I switch it out. So this is 0 0.31316 times X. This is going to be 0 0.5548 times V2X plus 0 0.6184 times, oops, keep doing those parentheses, V3X. So again, I think I'm not going to say everything again, uh, but you can look at this. Um, and this would be the numeric conversion of the equation that we saw with these kind of fitted coefficients using the least squares method to uh, make our best estimates for what these coefficients would be if this is the model that we think is underlying this relationship. Now, kind of a, a preview of what's going to be coming. It's not something that's super important at this point yet. Um, and that's just thinking about um, what happens when we have larger and larger models. Um, so the thing is, we can um, fit interaction terms to any predictors that we have. Um, so we talked about only having one numeric predictor and one, um, one um, kind of categorical predictor. But we ended up splitting up into three dummy variables because we had three categories. Um, but the, the question is going to follow, what happens if I have two or three or four or five numeric predictors? What if I have multiple categorical predictors? This gets really complicated really quickly if we're trying to think of every single model combination that we could fit. Um, and so, so the first thing that you should know at this point is just that, um, um, that, that we can use algorithms coming up that are going to help us. We don't have to like literally, rotely look at every combination because it's just way too confusing. It's also really hard to make sense of these complicated models, which is why we don't want to fit really complicated models unless we really need to, unless it just really, really makes sense to do so. Um, but I just kind of want to mention that um, if we had another numeric predictor in this model, so let's say that, um, let's say that X1 is a numeric predictor. Let's say that X2 is a numeric predictor. Let's say that um, X3 is a numeric predictor. Um, and then we can do interactions between numeric predictors as well. We could even do interactions between, um, you know, like a categorical predictor, like a dummy variable, and two numeric predictors. So, so then we get into this area where we have three, like a three-way interaction term um, that we could possibly fit. Um, and so that three-way interaction term could also be broken up into this expression. 
Um, but honestly, this is not super important other than just kind of like opening this this door of um, like these are the possibilities when we allow when we allow ourselves to do this. Um, and so usually when we, we want to judge these kinds of models, we start by judging the most complicated term and working our way down um, to see um, um, you know, what would make most sense, like how far we need to go, like how far we can simplify before we're happy with our model and we feel strongly that the predictors that we have left really are doing something. Um, but yeah, again, not super important, that section of the book for now, um, but, but just a word of what's going to be coming ahead.